I'd like to welcome the Ballantyne Rock Hill campuses who join us for this uh, time together. It's really wonderful to have you guys here. Um, today's message is the second part of the I3 strategy, intercede, invest, and invite. Uh, my wife, Marilyn, didn't she do a wonderful job last week? Yay, Marilyn. Go, Marilyn, my wife, Marilyn. Yeah. Um, talked about intercede and, and how to hear the voice of God, for God to lay on your heart and burden your heart for someone who doesn't know him that you can invest your life in as you just saw. Uh, you'll be surprised if you just ask the Lord to lead you to someone. He will. And you can invest your life in that person and then have the greatest joy of all, and that is the seeing of someone who does not know Christ come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. I've had a lot of wonderful joyous experiences in my life. I've never had a greater joy than to know that the Lord has used me to help bring somebody into his kingdom for all eternity. Everything else, folks, is temporal. Everything else is temporal. To help bring somebody into the kingdom of God forever, that's what's really important. We call it in church circles the evangelism imperative. Not suggestion, but imperative. It's a command of the Lord. Uh, for example, Matthew 28, verse 19. Many of you know this verse. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Jesus' last words before he ascended into heaven, if you've ever been around a loved one and they're dying, you cling to their last words because you know they're your loved one's most important thoughts. Jesus' most important thoughts were go into the world and make disciples. A disciple can't become a disciple until they first make a decision. And then they become a follower who then invests their lives in other people. Then Jesus said in Acts 1.8, another word right before his ascension into heaven, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. That when you receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you receive his resurrection power. The power that raised Jesus from the dead now lives in those who believe. That's Romans 8, 11. Can you believe that? It's a remarkable statement. The power that raised Jesus from the dead and exalted him to be king of kings and lord of lords now lives in the hearts of those people who believe in him. And when that happens, you become a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm just curious, all three campuses, how many of you would call yourselves disciples of Jesus, followers of Jesus, Christians? Raise your hand. Okay, you're a witness for the Lord. Now, now the question is, what kind of witness are you? Are you an effective one or a non-effective one? Can you imagine a jury trial where the defense attorney calls you as a witness and your testimony has no credibility? you're probably not called as a witness because the very term witness implies credibility to what you've seen and heard and know. So there's an imperative that's a part of the call of the Christian to evangelism, to help bringing people to faith in Christ. In fact, in my old dad's Presbyterian rootage, he had a book of order that guided the order of the church. And I'll never forget, there was a phrase in my dad's book of order in the Presbyterian tradition that said, evangelism is the urgent and primary task of the church. Last time I checked, urgent means now, primary means first. Why? Why is evangelism such an imperative? Well, it's March Madness, isn't it? And for every basketball fan, this is la pièce de résistance, as the French say. This is the best of the best time of year. You just enjoy this because from Thursday through Sunday, it's just carpet to carpet, game after game. And if you've especially got a team in the tournament that you want to win, you're especially excited, right? And when your team loses, it's gut-wrenching, isn't it? I mean, it just tears your gut out. And for those of you who still are in that position today, my heart just bleeds for you. It just really does. I'm so sorry. But if you've got a team that's still in the tournament, that has somehow been able to survive and march on, and has somehow pulled out a nail-biting, cliff-hanging game 
where you sat on the edge of your seat watching it going, there's no way they can possibly win, but somehow, by the mercies and grace of Almighty God, by the resurrection power of Jesus, your team is pulled out from the throes of defeat to victory. It's a wonder to celebrate, isn't it? Some of you know what I'm talking about, don't you? Okay. My point being this. It's not fun to lose, is it? It's fun to win, isn't it? Every single one of us has a soul inside of us. You are not a body who has a soul. You are a soul that has a body. And every single person that's born has an eternal living soul in their hearts. And that soul is destined to one of two places, either in an eternal relationship with the God who created that soul or an eternal relationship separated from the God who created that soul. And folks, that's why historically for 2,000 years in the history of church evangelism, evangelism has been called soul losing. No, soul winning. Soul winning. Because when someone comes to faith in Christ, it should produce such an astounding joy in our heart, it far exceeds anything that goes on during March Madness. When we see someone who finally realizes their souls pickled with pride, saturated with sin, and they take the cross upon their lives and absorb their sin upon the cross and then receive the resurrection power of Jesus. They know when that day comes and we have to take off this earthly body and we will all take it off. Don't you realize that? The statistics are in. One out of one die. You are aware of that, aren't you? Every single one of us will take off this earthly body. But what happens next? For those who believe, the Bible says, as we take off the old earthly body, we are enrobed with an eternal resurrection body in which we live forever in perfect union with Christ, the Father in heaven, the Holy Spirit, the angels worshiping him, loving him, not just floating around on a cloud all day long in heaven, which some of you think, is that going to be boring in heaven? No. We'll be a part of exploring the expanses of the universe and heaven, getting to know all the saints for all the ages, being in one with Jesus, worshiping, fellowshipping. It will be glorious. No place of tears, turmoils, trials, or tribulation. Does anybody here look forward to that day? I certainly do. It's going to be the most enormously wonderful day possible. But it is called soul winning because the soul is enshrouded in a new resurrection body. It's an imperative. Why? Because the alternative is losing. That's why Jesus called those who didn't know him lost. It's an imperative. So what I want to do is seize upon my beloved's message last week, Marilyn, who's the most wonderful person who's ever walked the face of this earth who gave you an insight into how to intercede and hear the voice of the Lord and take the second part of the I3 series to invest your life in other people to help you be a part of God's real calling upon his church, and that is to win people for him. Next week we'll be invite Jonathan Scott, our wonderful pastor here, will help teach you how to actually share the gospel and invite people to Christ, how to put them on your arm and bring them to church and all of that kind of thing. But today we're going to look at some steps on how we can invest our lives into other people because winning in Jesus' sight is so very important. Eternity hangs in the balance for people's souls. God did not call the church to be an audience to sit and watch performers and listen to a good message. God called his church to be an army that marches into the world that has victories against the foe, particularly to bring people to Christ. So if that's the case, let me give you an I3 strategy from Colossians, the fourth chapter, verses 2 through 6. If you have your Bibles, please open up there to me. You can go on your iPhones, your iPads. That's fine with me as long as you follow along. If you don't have a Bible, go to the information booth afterwards. We'll gladly, joyously give you one. It's in the version I read, the ESV version, which means the extra spiritual version. No, it doesn't mean that, folks. The English standard version, it will be in this. If you want to go get one, just the only thing I ask you is what? Bring it. 
Every week, you don't go to school without your textbook. You don't come to worship and hearing the word without the word in your hands. So somehow, follow along with me. Let's do so now when we have longer texts and are able to. i like to ask you to stand in reverence for the reading of the word. If you're able, would you please stand? The early church did this to honor the scripture as the absolute authority, the word of God. Paul wrote, Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray also for us that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I'm in prison, that I may make it clear which is how I ought to speak. So notice that Paul begins this section of Scripture with Marilyn's words last week, continue steadfastly. The Greek word is agonizomai. It's very familiar to the uh, English word what? Agony. You you agonize in prayer for people that you want to come to faith in Christ. Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful, being alert for God's voice to speak to you, and always pray with thanksgiving. Why pray with thanksgiving? Because it is the antidote to pride. A prideful Christian is an oxymoron. You can't be a prideful Christian. Thanksgiving assures humility because you realize everything comes from God. So prayer is the foundation for helping people come to faith in Christ. Then he continues, walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer each person. The word of the Lord. You may be seated. So so in these verses, Paul gives us some insights into how to invest our lives in other people. Here's the first one. We are to pray for them steadfastly, agonize over them, and the whole implication of praying for people implies we love the lost as God loves the lost. We love the world as God loves the world. Uh, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his son that whoever believes in him will never perish eternal separation but have eternal life the resurrection body in relationship with God the Father now notice that in that verse and in this idea of needing to love the world to reach the world this church called Forest Hill does not have a Christ over culture mindset what does that mean that we just pray and we just worship and we just read our Bibles and we're just in life groups and we enjoy our holy huddles, we're in fellowship with one another. In other words, we're so heavenly minded, we're no earthly good. Nor are we Christ against culture, which means we stand against the culture telling the world how awful it is, how evil it is, how it's going to go to hell. And we remove ourselves and just throw firebombs into the culture, grenades whenever we can, even rejoice when they blow up and make people hurt because we're righteous and holy. That is not the call of Christ. We're not Christ against culture. We are called to be Christ in culture. And the only way you can be in culture to transform culture for the glory of God is to love the world. Why do you love it? Because God loves it. God created this world. He never created it to be broken like it is right now. Let me give you an example. Do any of you think God created a cancer cell? Do any of you really believe that? Certainly not. You know, I have three kids. You think I would give them a cancer cell? Do you think that'd be a part of my love for them? Of course not. God created this world perfectly, Genesis 1 and 2. Genesis 3 is the fall. Every part of this world has become broken in shambles. Everything from alcohol addictions to marital breakups to every kind of dysfunction possible is because of the fall. That's not God's fault. It's our fault. It's in rebellion against him. There are two paths. The narrow path, which means following God's ways. The broad path, which means we do it our way. Most people are on the broad path, Jesus said. We're the ones who've messed up God's world. But even though we've messed it up, God still loved it. He entered into the world through Jesus. He took on human flesh and came to be a part of this world because he loves the world. He's calling us who follow him to love the world similarly. And if you love the world, you'll have, for example, Paul's view toward the Jews that he expressed in Romans 9, verse 3. Quick background before I read the verse to you. Paul is a Jew. 
persecutes the church because he didn't like these apostates, kills, who knows, probably hundreds, maybe thousands of Christians. He meets Jesus on a road to Damascus. Jesus tells him, you're now a proclaimer of my gospel, first to the Jews and then to the Gentiles. So Paul, as a Jew, writes these words in Romans 9, 3. For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, Jews, according to the flesh. Did you, did you just see what he said? Did, did you just grab what he just said? Paul said, I would be willing to go to hell myself if it meant the salvation of my kinsmen, my fellow Jews. Now, now how do you describe that? Except a deep, abiding love for the lost. Do you have that kind of love for the lost? Do you? Do you ever think about friends and family members who are accursed, separated from Christ and the Father forever, unless there's the forgiveness of sins? You've got to love the lost as God loves the lost willing to go to a cross, willing to die, willing to be separated and go to hell myself if that would mean somebody else could be saved. Secondly, you then pray for open doors to reach them. This is seizing some upon what which Marilyn talked about last week. Uh, Acts 16, 6 through 10 expresses what Paul said in Colossians 4 when he said, pray that God may open to us a door for the word to be spoken in Acts 16, verses 6 through 10, one of the most pivotal sections of Scripture in all of the Bible, if this part of the story of the spread of the gospel of Jesus Christ by Paul doesn't happen, folks, you and I aren't here today. L let me tell you what's going on just by reading the text to you. And they went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. And when they came to Messia, they attempted to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them to do so. so. So here's the deal. Paul is in Galatia, which is western Turkey, eastern Turkey today. And he starts moving north, thinking he's going to go into Asia, present-day Russia, Belarus, Uzbekistan, all those countries. And the Holy Spirit says, no. Remember John 10, 27? Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. John 10, 27. You read it. My sheep hear my voice. So Paul and his companions think, let's go north. The Holy Spirit says, no. They keep going west. They go 400 miles on foot. And several times they start to go north again. And the Holy Spirit forbids them, Paul says. Stops them. Hey, have you ever had that happen to you? where the Holy Spirit literally says, no, don't do that. Don't go there. If you go there, you might get hurt. No, don't do that. that that's what they experienced. So they kept going west. So passing by Messiah, they went down to Troas. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia, which is northern Greece today, across the Aegean Sea from Troas, which is right on the western end of Turkey today. It still exists as a city. And there was this Macedonian man standing there urging him and saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. And when Paul had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go on into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. Now, now, why this means a lot to me is because Marilyn and I have stood on the shores of Troas, right where that Macedonian vision occurred. And I felt an eerie presence of God. I, I can't explain it. But somewhere near where we were standing, after 400 miles of westward journey, go north, nope, Okay, westward journey, go north, forbidden, go westward journey, whoops, we're at the Aegean Sea, what do we do now, Lord? A vision of a man, Macedonian in descent, says to Paul, come and share the gospel. 
which if you know the book of Acts, Paul crosses over the Aegean Sea and goes to the city called Philippi, establishes the church there, later writes a letter to it called the letter to the Philippians. You're very good. Thank you very much. Who's buried in Grant's tomb? Okay, thank you. Who established the church of Philippi? Paul did for the Philippians. Good. I'm proud of you. Okay, so he goes and preaches the gospel there. The Philippians come to faith in Christ and the gospel grows. Now, what happened though was he must have prayed to God for God to open doors, and he went some places and God kept the door closed. He went finally to Troas. God opened the door for him to go to Macedonia. And why is this important, folks? If Paul had gone north to Asia into present-day Russia instead of west through, crossing the Aegean into Macedonia, you and I wouldn't be here today probably. God knew the gospel needed to go west eventually to Rome, and then to Spain, and then to Germany and England across the sea to America today because Paul listened to the voice of the Lord. You and I are here today worshiping Jesus. And as Paul spoke to Paul, he wants to do the same to us as we pray for God to open doors and shut other doors. Did you know this fact, by the way, present-day Iran? In the year 1971, there were 300 Christians in the nation of Iran. You you know Iran, big nuclear potential battle on the horizon, Israel and all of that, Iran. 300 Christians in Iran in the year 1970. Today, some 40 or so years later, there are over 300,000. Yes, in Muslim-oriented dominated Iran, 300,000 Christians growing exponentially by the years. You know how they're mostly growing? Visions. <laughs> they're doing everything they can to keep out Christian radio and Christian television. You know what they can't stop? Or visions. Jesus is literally appearing to people, literally, and telling them, you are the one for whom you've been seeking. Because here's the deal. Jesus said, if you seek, you'll find. If you ask, the door will be open to you. It will all happen if you just have a heart of seeking. And and there are many people around the world, folks, who don't have access to the gospel, but if they're really seeking, believe me, God can get to them. Don't you believe that? Is God unable to reach anyone? Of course not. Where there's a heart of true seeking, that's why at the judgment, nobody's going to be with an excuse. No one will be with an excuse. If someone is really seeking the truth, God has every means available in the universe to reach that person for him, for Christ. And that's what happened with Paul. He didn't know what to do. God gave him a vision. Now, God might give you a vision. He might not. It may be the whisper that Marilyn talks about in her book. Sometimes God whispers. It might be a roar. Sometimes God roars in your ears. I remember driving down the road one time, and God roared in my ear. I can't explain this. I don't understand it. But he said, go into that office building and tell your friend that if he doesn't repent, he's going to go to jail. And I went, what? I mean, Lily. I mean, are you kidding me? Do it. I, I did that. walked into his office and said, this is crazy. I, I, I know you think I'm nuts. But, but if you don't repent and stop what you're doing, God told me you're going to go to jail. And I didn't know anything. And I walked out and said, God bless you. Have a nice day. Happy face. You know, all that kind of thing. Anyway. And you know what happened? He went to jail a year later. God will speak to you sometimes in a whisper, sometimes in a roar, sometimes in visions. But God will speak to you if you have a heart for him to use you to reach other people, to speak to other people for the glory of God. So love what God loves the most, lost people. That's why Jesus came, Luke 19, 10. Jesus said, I came to seek and save that which was lost. Secondly, pray for open doors. Thirdly, be an attractive witness. Be an attractive witness. Um, Is your witness viable? Do, Do people see in your witness credibility? Do they see a consistent walk with Christ? Um, you, you know, if you are around somebody who has a bad cold, what's your greatest fear? That that person is contagious, that their germs might be breathed on you and you get what they have. Let me ask you something. Are you a contagious Christian? 
When you breathe on people who don't know Christ, do they catch who Jesus is in you? Is your identity solely and totally in Christ? Or are you still trying to find the fanciful lies of this world to fill your heart with meaning? I'll never forget hearing a minister talk about a young girl that, that came to him and just had her identity wrapped up in boys, and she slept with every boy she possibly could, and ultimately those girls become older girls who sleep with every boy possible to find identity in something other than Christ. And he explained the gospel to her, how Jesus died on the cross to give her a new life and a new purpose, a new meaning. And she heard it, and she said, you know, I, I believe that. And then she paused for a second and said, but I don't think it'll make any difference if boys don't find me attractive. She doesn't get it. She doesn't get identity solely in Christ. Do you find your identity solely in Christ? Not in your husband, not in your wife, not in a boyfriend, not in a girlfriend, not in how well your kids do academically or athletically. Is your identity solely wrapped up in Christ and Christ alone? Be an attractive witness. If you're contagious, people will catch what you've got, sometimes without even saying a word. Fourth, the best use of your time, Paul said, we all have 24 hours a day, don't we? And it gets gobbled up by all kinds of different demands upon us. And it seems like there's never enough minutes in the day to do all that we want to do. That's why Paul said, be careful with the use of your time with outsiders. In other words, carve out some time every week that you can give to people in whom you can invest. Whoever that might be, playing tennis, going for a walk, having lunch, whatever it might be. All of us have the same amount of time every week, and we've got to carve out certain amounts of time just to invest in people. Fifth, let our speech be seasoned with salt. Seasoned with salt. Salt does no good if it stays in the salt shaker, does it? For salt to be effective, it must leave the salt shaker and permeate the meat or the other substances giving saltiness too. If it stays in the salt shaker, it has no use. If it's out of the salt shaker, it can season, it can purify, it can keep something from putrefying. Salt has value only out of the salt shaker. One of the most powerful things each one of us has is this thing in our mouth. Everybody take hold of it. Come on, all campus, take hold of it. Call the tongue. Got it? Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. True or lie? It is a lie. You know, the, the, the proverb says, life and death is in the tongue. Some of you right now are indelibly scarred by significant others who spoke death to you. They said things like, why can't you ever be like, fill in the blank, or you have compared yourself to a spouse or somebody and thought, I'm not valuable because I'm not as good as. And you may have even said that to that person and wounded them. Life and death is in the tongue. And there's nothing more powerful than speech that's seasoned with the salt of grace. There's nothing more valuable each week, folks, for me to be able to stand before you and tell you, you are a child of God, uniquely created by the Father. There's no one in the world like you. And though you've rebelled, he still died on the cross to invite you into an intimate, personal relationship with him. And he loves you. He loves you. <laughs> he just loves you. And he wants you to drown in the sea of his grace. Doesn't that make you feel good? It should. Because that's the power of words seasoned with grace. So when you're investing your life in people, tell them how valuable they are to God, how important they are to God, how much they're loved by God, that Jesus would go to the point of dying on a cross to forgive them for all of their sins. Let your speech be seasoned with salt. And finally, Paul says, number six, be able to answer their questions. When they ask you questions, be able to answer them. There are all kinds of resources available to us today. The one thing the computer age has brought, you know, with everything that's been brought to us that's contemporary and technological, it has a good side and it has a bad side, doesn't it? Computers have a bad side. They can drain our energies. They can consume our time. They can give us sexual images. God never intended to enter our hearts. 
So computers can be used in an evil way. They can also be used in a wonderful way. Never before have we been interconnected globally like we are. Now, we can communicate with anybody all over the world. Moreover, there are online resources available to everybody about most any subject. And if you have questions about the Christian faith, you ought to be able to go online to get those answers. But just in case you want to know them, here are the three most often asked questions now that I experience. One is, who's Jesus? And your answer's got to be, you don't have the option of saying he's just a good moral man, a moral teacher, a good rabbi. Why? Because he didn't say that about himself. What you've got to say to people as you're involving them in a conversation is, who is Jesus? He claimed to be God in human flesh because only God can die for the forgiveness of our sins. Do you understand this? If I hurt you, only you can forgive me. Only the offended party can forgive the person who hurt them. You understand? Does that make sense to you? Only if you've been hurt can you forgive me. Well, who's the offended party with sin? God is. So only God can forgive us. And the cross, unique to Christianity, is the one way that God came to earth to forgive us of our sins so that we could have a relationship with him. And he had to do that by being God. Only God can forgive our sins. Only God can die on a cross. Who is Jesus? Not a mere man. He's got to be the perfect God man who lived the life we could not live and died in our stead on the cross. What about hell? That's offensive to me. How dare you try to evangelize me to hell? Well, I say to pers- people like that, well, first of all, for you to evangelize people to believe that there's not a hell's evangelism, isn't it? it? That's an equal form of evangelism. You're just taking that view that there is no hell. But let me say this about hell. Hell is the natural human response to human, uh, to, it's the natural response from God to human free will. Hell is the monument that God has built to free will. God's not going to force anybody to love him. He'll give us the privilege of rejecting him. Why? Because love can only exist if there's free will. I've shared this with you before. If I wound up Marilyn every morning as a little Barbie doll, and she walked around going, I love you, David. I love you, David. I love you, David. I love you, David. That's not love. She's a puppet at that point. She's a robot at that point. I risk every morning Marilyn looking me in the eye and saying, after 34 years, I don't love you anymore. Because love can only exist if she freely chooses to love me. Love can only exist if she has the power not to love me. Love can only exist with us and God if we freely have the power not to love him. And hell is the natural consequence of God giving us the privilege of freely choosing not to love him. And by the way, the person who taught us the most about hell in the Bible is Jesus. Finally. Number seven, know when to move on. Know when to move on. In Luke 9, 3 through 5, Jesus says, when you go out, disciples, there are going to be times when you're in a community, they don't receive the message, so knock the dust off your shoes and move on. I don't know when you're called to do that by the Holy Spirit. As he opens doors, he also closes doors. You need to listen to his voice, but there will be some times that God says, that's enough, they've heard enough, go to the next person who's willing to hear, knock the dust off your shoes and move on. So go and be ready to move on when you need to move on. One final thought. This is a war, folks. And if you commit yourself to be a person used by Jesus to bring other people to faith, you just need to know the opposition, the enemy, does not like it one bit. And you are inviting a force and a power to come against your heart like you've never known before. But I'm going to give you some great news. 1 John 4, 4, he who lives in me is greater than he who lives in the world. Amen? Romans 8, 37, I'm more than a conqueror in Jesus Christ our Lord. Right? He said that nothing can separate me from the love of God. Amen? 2 Corinthians 2, 14, thanks be to God who always leads me in the triumph. Right? You like to say amen more than right, okay? Amen? 
Isaiah 54, 17, no weapon formed against me will prosper. No weapon formed against me will prosper. And here's the bottom line. Through the cross and the resurrection that we're about to experience two weeks from now, through the resurrection, the power that raised Jesus from the dead lives in us. That's wonderful news. That means March Madness. And all the victories are ours today and forever. Would you give God the glory for that? Please do.